Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz at ClassicsToday.com here to talk about the best recordings of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, Le Sacre du Printemps, that amazing colossal masterpiece that created 20th century music as we know it, at least part of 20th century music, the non-Schoenberg half of 20th century music as we know it. Now, as with pictures in an exhibition, which I just talked about a little while ago. There are millions of recordings of this piece. It has become, you know, one of the ultimate orchestral showpieces. Most conductors try their hand at it. And the issue with the Sacre is really pretty simple. It's, do you have the balls to give the music the drive, the energy, the savagery that Stravinsky wrote into it? Anybody can play it these days. The question is, can you play it with character, personality? So, which are the performances that do that? Well, first, I'm going to talk about a couple of sleepers, as I call them, sleepers, you know, performances you probably haven't thought about for a while, but that really deserve consideration. The first is this one, uh, Carol Antrill with the Czech Philharmonic. Antrill was a great Stravinsky conductor, truly a great Stravinsky conductor. I mean, his Les Nos and Oedipus Rex and all that are fabulous. Um, and his recording here of Petrushka and the Rite of Spring are equally fine. You know, the Czech Philharmonic was in vintage form at this period. But what makes this performance so interesting and I think, you know, so vital and unique is that he really gets the folk element. You know, the fact is there are tunes in here, quite a few of them. Stravinsky borrowed them from various collections of Russian folk music, and you hear that. You hear that quite wonderfully, particularly thanks to those marvelous Czech woodwinds. So this is a recording that I recommend you hear because it really has a, a character all of its own, and it, and it gives the music personality and and a distinctive color and feeling of, of, of Russianness, even though it's Czech that I think is really very special. And by the way, that no Russian performances have for some reason. Anyway, the next one on the sort of opposite end of the scale is Otmar Sweetner with the Staatskapelle Dresden. Now, you know, I said previously that when German orchestras do things that are completely outside of their Fach, you know, they, they kind of, they have, there are two ways that they can go. Either it's going to be a disaster or it's going to have the kind of the kind of naughty glee that you get that, you know, when a Puritan first views pornography. I mean, you know, they, they, they really get into it. This is very, very exciting, this performance. Now, granted, it's a little bit on the slow side, a little bit deliberate. It is German after all. Um, and the sacrificial dance may be more like, you know, the Luftwaffe during the London Blitz, but it gets the, makes the point. It, it gets the music across and wow, do they play. It, the savagery is just tremendous. Next we have this very interesting classic release on Testament, both of Igor, Igor Markevich's recordings, both with the Philharmonia Orchestra, one in mono and one in stereo. Now, the, the mono recording is a little bit more cautious, a little bit more on the deliberate side than the stereo recording, which is more uninhibited, faster, and of course, sonically superior. But they're both quite interesting and worth hearing because Markevich was one of the great Stravinsky conductors of all time. And to have these two coupled together is, well, it's, let's face it, it's for diehard Rite of Spring fans. But if you are one of them, then this is something you're definitely going to want to hear. But now we come to more modern recordings and the most recommendable of those, and there are really quite a few. Um, it's, it's a piece that's done awfully well on disc. First, Pierre Boulez with the Cleveland Orchestra. Now, he recorded it twice with the Cleveland Orchestra, the second time for Deutsche Grammophon. That one isn't as good as this one. This is his first for Sony, and it has a, a, a sharpness and clarity that the latter one just doesn't have. I think actually Boulez got a little soft later in, in old age, and he was a little, he was better when he was still his more sort of uncompromising avant-garde self as he is in this performance. It's not the fastest, but it's certainly one of the cleanest and clearest, and the rhythms are fabulously well projected. And because it's the Cleveland Orchestra, you know, they play the living daylights out of it. It's just wonderful. However, if you want another one that goes less for, you know, absolute perfection of rhythm, but all in for just pulverizing force, 
Moody with the Philadelphia Orchestra. This recording came as something of a shock because, you know, after Ormandy passed away and Moody took over, nobody really knew that the Philadelphia Orchestra could play a piece of music like this in such a hard hitting manner. You know, the, 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 all that sensual, you know, string, string, luscious string texture and all the stuff that, that Ormandy was famous for gave way to something quite different under Moody. And this is one heck of a performance, something he was very proud of. And I think that's held up extremely well. You know, you might not remember this, but Ormandy also recorded The Rite of Spring in mono, and it's not bad. It's really not bad. He, was, he could surprise us too. But this is one of the great rites, and, and Philadelphia you know, never worked harder to, more, uh, effect, it, it, to better effect than in this performance. Staying with the American orchestras for a while, we have Michael Tilson Thomas and the Boston Symphony. Now, this was also Tilson Thomas's first recording, and it's also one of the great ones. This performance also has, I don't know, it has all the power and noise you could want, but there's, a, there's like a lyricism to it, uh, a melodiousness that's, that's very, very special. You know, the, the Boston Symphony has been called the world's greatest French orchestra because of, you know, its long line of conductors from Kusevitsky to Monteux to Munch. And, and this reminds me a little bit of that. They play it almost a little bit like French music. The music has a balletic quality to it. And Tilson Thomas's performance is incredibly exciting. And it's coupled to the very rarely heard cantata, The King of the Stars. This is a French DG issue, and it also has the... Uh, Dutois Petrushka, which is excellent also. But for, you know, a, a first recording of the Rite of Spring by a young conductor, this was an amazing achievement, and it still sounds fabulous today. Another classic was this one, Leonard Bernstein with the New York Philharmonic. Now, he did it three times, the first time with the New York Phil, the second time with the London Symphony, and the third time with the Israel Phil. And this is also still the best. It's a knockout of a performance. Stravinsky himself was supposed to have been very impressed by it. You know, one of the things that Bernstein does is he gets the emotion in music, which according to Stravinsky had no emotion, but it does. And in the sacrificial dance, one of the things that happens is that in this performance is that it gets initially slower and slower and louder and heavier until, you know, that first big pause. And then it takes off like a shot. It's, it's a thrilling, thrilling interpretation. It's like a 50 car pile up on the New Jersey turnpike during a fog bank. It's, it's just great. And nobody else does anything quite like it. It's a thrilling performance by, again, by a conductor who, who had no inhibitions and who had no problem revealing the music's lack of inhibitions. However, when it comes down to it, there are two recordings, two recordings that I think really are the most exciting and the best played, um, a combination of both. For sheer raw excitement, and this one may surprise you, Azawa and the Chicago Symphony. Now, of course, the Chicago Symphony at this time was a powerhouse among orchestras, and Azawa was just beginning his career he made a few recordings in Chicago for RCA, and, and, and they're wonderful. I mean, they're absolutely wonderful before he got the Boston Symphony. And this is an absolutely thrilling performance. It has the most exciting sacrificial dance of any of them. I always, I always you know, get a laugh when I read, you know, plot synopses where, you know, it's a, a sacrificial dance to propitiate the gods. I mean, I never hear anybody talk about propitiating except in in conjunction with the sacrificial dance. And when you think about, you know, if you've seen, have you seen those those sketches for the original sacrificial dance? You know, there's this waif-like ballerina in a gauzy sort of veil thing spinning around. And then you listen to the music and it's, you know, it sounds like a tank battle. I mean, it sounds really, the best way to experience the piece in some ways is to see Walt Disney's Fantasia, you know, where, where it represents Darwinian evolution, right? And you know, the sacrificial dance actually isn't even in there. All the rest of it is. But it kind of fascinates me to think that, that you know, this sort of megalith of, of primitivism is supposed to be this solo ballerina hopping about on stage. No wonder, I mean, it's no wonder the thing caused a riot. I mean, because the, the discontinuity between, between what you probably saw and what the music sounded like couldn't have been more graphic. 
And I was very conscious of this hearing this performance because the sacrificial dance is so thrilling in its, in its abandon and savagery and so completely not a virgin dancing herself to death to propitiate the gods. Well, anyway, if I were a god, I would feel propitiated and so will you. Finally, last but not least, another disc that you might think is a bit of a sleeper, but I think for sonics and performance and playing is really, really almost unparalleled. And that's the Cleveland Orchestra again, but this time with Ricardo Chailly. Now, Chailly was a great Stravinsky, and this disc contains, you know, all three of the big Stravinsky ballets, the Firebird in sweet form, plus Jeu de Carte and Apollon Musagette. Um, those are all played with the Concerto Bell. But for the Rite of Spring, it was one of his earlier recordings. Before he got the Concerto Bell, he had the Cleveland Orchestra. And, and you know, it has all of Boulez's sharpness and cleanness and clearness but with that extra edge of warm-blooded, savage intensity. It's, it's just a knockout of a performance. And if I have to pull out one version of the Rite of Spring, again, to sort of introduce your, my friends to, or to, to give a sense of what the music has the potential to express, then Shai is my choice. And I'm very curious to know what yours is. I think this is a pretty, pretty comprehensive selection. It's not a piece that opens itself up to wide degrees of interpretation. I mean, Stravinsky generally doesn't do that. And you may very well be wondering how I feel about Stravinsky's own recordings, because he did it. Uh, how many is it? Stereo, a mono? Is, I think there are four of them, at least. There may be more. They're lousy. Who are we kidding? They're, 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 he barely gets through the work. The playing is never very good. The sonics were never that spectacular. And, you know, for all that he liked to say that his way was the way, his way was not the way in the Rite of Spring because there's so much more in the music than he as an interpreter was able to realize. And that was just his shortcoming. It's not a crime, but I think anybody who, who insists that Stravinsky has unique insights to offer in this piece is absolutely delusional. There isn't anything he has to offer in this music that others haven't done better. So that's my take on the Rite of Spring. Keep on listening, folks. Thank you and be well.